<laughs> All righty, folks, we are now recording, and we have the honor of meeting with Lee Kaneko, who is going to talk to us tonight about residencies, and we're going to go beyond that. And um, I'm trying to think, we, how long have you and I known each other? Do you think 25? I bet it was 1983 or 4 or 5. Mm, yeah, probably. It's been a long time. Right. And um, you were in the building uh, that burnt down. I was, yeah. And you were in the building with the elevator shaft people took advantage of. That's right. <laughs> um, and where are you? You're in Omaha, right? I'm in Omaha, Nebraska, yeah. And where did you grow up? In Omaha, Nebraska. And where did you go to high school? In Omaha? In Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> where did you go to college? In Omaha, Nebraska. And do you have a passport or do you just always stay in Omaha? <laughs> I do quite well here. Lots of warehouses. <laughs> Lots of warehouses. And were you interested in art when you were in high school? Yes. And what did you do about it? Did I ran you make away art? Really, I, I ran away from every class that I could get out of and go to the art department. I guess that worked out all right. Worked out just dandy. And did you did you focus on art in college? Yes. As an artist. As an artist. And how did you become an administrator? You know, I guess you went from gallery owner to administrator to not for profit director to artist partner. Lay all that out a little bit for us, okay? Well, I started out as a young artist, and I was looking for a studio space. So that led to um, real estate, obviously, needing to find a studio, wanting to find a studio, wanting a studio to do what, you know, size and scale you wanted. So that led me to older buildings. And the first building I had was 12,000 square feet. I obviously didn't need all of it. So I, uh, so I started a, a program where, uh, you know, people got a, it was 19, uh, what was that, 81, I think. Mm, no, 70s. That was the 70s. I, uh, I, uh, 71. I, uh, you know, rented out a studio for 50 bucks to people, you know. We had 14 studios in that building. It's a nice building. And then we had a kind of a shared gallery. And that lasted about four or five years. And then it went into a, a, a full gallery situation. And then it moved into putting artists to work at industrial sites, which I did for three or four years. And then it went into, let's do this year round. And then it became 14 studios with stipends. We've always offered stipends. And um, it, it, then I uh, got out of a rental building I had, which I was probably paying ten thousand dollars a month. There was a lot of buildings for wow. that, but it was like sixty thousand square feet. And then we got the, that was the old Bemis Bag Company, and that's why the residency pro program was called Bemis. We kind of took. So wait, wait, let me interrupt there and define that for that people that don't know. You were seminally involved in beginning a alternative artist work site in Omaha, Nebraska named Bemis, B-E-M-I-S, yeah. and you did that, what, for maybe the first dozen years of the place, and then you sort of um, tried to obsolete yourself and partially succeeded? I actually stayed there 25 years. It took longer than oh, I wow. thought ever to finish it because we we were renting for the first 10 years, 10, 12 years, and then we morphed into buying, and then buying took, uh, you know, raising money for the renovation. But we have a 100,000 square foot building, and it is uh, uh, now has about, um, I think it has 12 studios, and it's only about half done, the building. They're large studios. We like large studios. And we're one of the few residency programs in America cause, uh, that offers stipends. Stipends are $750 a month. I'd like to see them at 1,000, but at 14 studios or so, it's to be costly, but you're also, all your utilities are paid for, and uh, you get some help with supplies, because there's a lot of things that we get out of industry. But everybody gets accommodations, too. They got a, a, oh, yeah, a large a room, space, a kitchen, a space, 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 and a studio space, and a lot of, okay, and 
if you want. So let's talk. Can we talk about the Bemis for a moment? We can talk about the Bemis. It was the it was sort of born out of the program that happened before it, which was a. Uh, well, actually, it started by in that older building. I started. Hey, Reed, let, me, let me interrupt you, Reed. Somebody asked if you could be louder, and maybe the best oh. way to be louder is closer. Well, yeah, louder could be closer. Louder could be a button here. How's that? Well, maybe that works too. God, you're so technologically proficient. I forget. I don't think so, babe. <laughs> <laughs> you know me, Paul. I'm not technical. I know, but you are surprising me, dear. Oh, come on. So okay. Anyway, ask me a question. Um. Well, first of all, guys, I was on the board of the Bemis, and I don't know, for maybe five of the early years, and I found it pretty exciting, but. So let's talk about the Bemis now, though. How many, so you think you have what? How many, how many artists are in residence? Right now, I think there's 14 studios there now. And, okay. Uh, and where do artists come from? How do you guys find each other? The, all over the world. They're, they're, uh, you know, back in the old days, we used to hand address things and send them out when people sent in a request or send them out to art agencies or send them out to other mm -hmm. European, South America. Japan, Korea, everywhere by mail. Now it's all done on the internet. And, uh, you know, they get over a thousand applications a year for about 35 residencies because our residencies last <coughs> something like uh, three to six months. When I first started the program, we really believed in year long residency programs so people could do a large body of work. We even let people come with their families. So, because uh, we had a lot of space, and we still do, but now it's more pared down to three months, uh, to six months, sometimes shorter, and uh, we usually don't do children. If there's children, uh, we usually find the artist an off-site uh, home, <laughs> place to live, so that the studio environment isn't maybe, you know, compromised at all by children. But it's a very active program. There's always something going on between, you know, the artists. By, by, in general, most residency programs are not very visible. They're uh, definitely a retreat. They're definitely, you know, reclusive by their nature. They're, uh, in my mind, you don't disturb the artists. Uh, we're urban. We're very urban. We're one of the... Uh, well, when we first started out, we were one of the few that were urban. There's a lot more now. And I felt an obligation to have uh, exhibition space. So we have about 15,000 square feet of exhibition space, and then two more floors of studios, and three more floors to finish. So that's where we're at with the Bemis. That's cool. When people apply for a residency at the Bemis, are they applying for a specific is session the right word, or are they just applying in general and they get reconsidered for the next time, or how does it work? The, the forms are online. If you look up BEMIS, B-E-M-I-S, Center for Contemporary Arts, uh, what happens is, is that you can select when you would like to come, a preference. Uh, you can say, I'm open all that year, or I can come at any time. I only want to come in the summer. I you know, want to spend the winter in Nebraska. That's a good idea. And so, <laughs> you know, you can uh, sign up for whatever amount of time. And that's always sort of, you know, it's that puzzle you put together when you have those uh, 35, 40 people that you're going to select and put into this uh, situation. And so it's kind of like they're all like blank dates with each other. It's kind of fun. We put them together. And, and it's surprising how sometimes it really works. Sometimes Is it meditated at all? I mean, are you selecting people and trying to create or do you just pick people at random? What's, I mean, it's, it's not no, you that, anymore, that, that, but how, how, what, what's the selection process? Uh, every residency program will be different about that. Ours is five judges, different medias, uh, and they select across the board. We are at the Bemis pretty much a visual arts program. We do not uh, necessarily get involved with writers. We don't necessarily get involved with theater. We don't fiddle around too much with dance or music. I'll tell you, uh, rule of thumb is that over 65% of the residency programs that you're going to find are for writers. Writers are a hell of a lot easier to service than 
than uh, a visual artist or somebody who needs a forklift or somebody who wants a bridge crane or somebody, you know, hammering away on steel. That's a, a lot more difficult than, uh, than uh, you know, putting up with a computer in someone's uh, solitude to uh, write. With art, visual artists, there must be a lot more synergy and meeting together and sharing meals and bouncing and more enthusiasm and more partying than there is with artists. I mean, than there is with writers. You know, I don't know because I hang around visual artists and they are all of the above. Uh, but I will tell you that when I developed this program, I was adamant after seeing several other programs about not eating three times a day together or having uh, a chef or a prescribed meal. People are adults and artists are, if anybody, they're picky, you know? They wanna eat organic or they wanna eat potato chips, who cares? It's not my problem. My problem is can they work? So uh, the, the point is is that maybe you don't wanna see people too. I mean, do you wanna really see the same people for three months? <laughs> well, you know, well, that's probably true too, because in Ragdale, that that people pretty much you know avoid each other, and there's a lot of quiet. <laughs> well, and some of those places like like Ragdale, you know, it, you can that's got a lot of land around it. Uh, or you go out to uh, McDowell, one of the oldest artist residency programs in America. You have a little cabana, and you come up to the big house, and you know, there's no grocery store you're going to walk down to or wine shop or bar. We're in the middle of an urban city of a million people, you know, so, uh, and in a developed area that's a renovated area that's become quite fashionable. So um, they say it's our fault. <laughs> but the fact is, is that, you know, people here can do whatever they want. We do not put any, we have two things we ask. We ask for a lecture during the residency. Uh, we do Thursday night lectures there once a month, and we always ask for a lecture. And then we also sometimes ask if they would like to consign or donate a piece to our annual art auction, which goes into helping more stipends. And so that's my, my goal on the board is to get those stipends up to $1,000 a month. So, you know, we pay the utilities, we pay that. We don't pay your travel into us. But every residency program is different, and it's different because of where it's born, the people who funded it, and how it initiated itself and, and survived. If you go to the website, Alliance of Artist Communities. Keep talking, I'll pull it up. Okay, go up to, this is a, you know, the Bemis started, uh, we were doing it anyway, but then it, 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 it got, uh, it got involved with being a larger situation called the Alliance of Artist Communities when the MacArthur Foundation had about uh, three or four million dollars left from the uh, Genius Grants one year. And a gentleman by the name of Ken Hope, who worked for MacArthur up there, I always thought that was a great name, Ken Hope. Anyway, he uh, decided that it was suspicious that a lot of very Things, a lot of very interesting things were going on at residency programs in in the United States that weren't hitting the radar. I mean, if you write a book, you're not signing books at a residency program. If you do, you know, chore choreograph and you're there and you, you have your troop of people in, you're performing on a stage somewhere else. If you make a whole lot of paintings at a residency program, the show is someplace else. So the residency program isn't the it's the retreat, it's not the place for the traffic. Because Bemis is in an urban situation like 18th Street in, in, in LA or some of the other programs, you have a tendency to want to interact with your community and open your doors. So that's a, a, a pretty interesting uh, a situation that we found ourselves in. Uh, if you go to Ucross in the middle of Wyoming, you're on 600 acres of land and you don't go anywhere except by car, <laughs> to get out of there. So, uh, you know, everyone's different. There, there's castles, there's old uh, army bases, there's, uh, there's one down in Marfa that's great. There's, uh, uh, there, uh, there's just residency programs across the United States that are very, very exciting programs for people to, to be in. 
if you need to get away, if you want to foster some sort of change, if you feel that it'll be productive for you, I always say to people, don't go to a residency unless you're going to do something a little different. You know, I, I think. Time out. Let's, let's push that a little bit. What do you mean? Well, if you're gonna, if you're comfortable, well, I don't. It depends on the person's situation. But if you have a studio situation, that's fine. Why would you go to a residency? Maybe. Well, you know, you can you can say you're like a cat. You need to be thrown up in the air and land on your feet. You need to be challenged. Sometimes we get too comfortable. Sometimes we need to see other people. Sometimes we get too insulated in our own studios and and don't have people come in our studios. Uh, sometimes it's good to have that other dialogue going on. Along with the program in the United States, which, by the way, the the, eight, the 14 of us who got this MacArthur money got together and, and formed the Alliance of Artist Communities umpteen years. I didn't know you were a founder. Oh, that's cool. When did, it, when did that happen? Well, it happened uh, 1990, 1990. We got the funds from MacArthur. And then each one of us, we got together called ourselves the Fairly Loose Association of Artist Communities because we didn't know if we even liked each other. And we never saw each other too much. Some of them had, the East Coast older ones had. And um, we had uh, each put in 5% of the money we received from MacArthur to start the organization. Was so, this a MacArthur idea? Or who, who came up with the idea in the first place? Well, the organization of Alliance of Artist Communities came from the 14, 14 recipients of the okay. MacArthur money. Got and it. that way, and then and MacArthur funded us as an organization then. And we used to, you know, like one year we did the checkbook, another year somebody did the checkbook and the organizational effort. Then finally we decided to, to break down and have an office, a real office, and do a directory and find out where all these other residency programs were. All right, so, so let me ask you some questions. How many residency programs do you think there are in the United States for visual artists? Uh, well, the Alliance has over 100, I think, on their list. I okay, that's the next question. How many, how many more people are not members? I, well, that's hard to monitor, but I think it's probably about another 50 to 60 for sure. Why would somebody not be a member? Because they're not accredited or you know, cool enough? Or they don't want to, or they don't have enough money, or they. I don't know. I really have no idea. And how many artists are in residency in the United States at a given moment, or the max, if it's whatever time of year that is? That's a very good question. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) But I know that the uh, counterpart organization, Res Artiste, that operates worldwide and offices are in Europe. You guys should be jotting down the names of these places. Yeah, Res Artis is R E S. I got it. Hold on, I got to go to a smaller screen okay. for this shit. They have 400 centers they cover, 400 different residency programs they cover around the world. So you can go somewhere pretty damn exotic. Well, you can go exotic. You can go to Iceland. There's Iceland. You know, there's everywhere. You can go to China. You can go anywhere you want. You know, and some of them are national parks. Some of them are chateaus. Some of them are old castles. Some of them are barns. You know, everything is here. What the important part is, is that somebody put down their foot and said, we're going to do something for the arts, and let's go to the source. Let's go to the artist. That's the hardest thing to to support. You don't know what they're going to make. You don't know them. They really do come in like blind dates. You don't know if they're going to get along with everybody else. Uh, you don't know if anything will come from it. And, and truly, if a person just needs to, you know, calm down, chill out, be there, and think about it for a while, that's fine, too. You know, so it, it's a very interesting uh, human endeavor in a way to support creativity uh, at that level, I believe. And I, I, I know I, I often joke about curators who don't like working with live artists because they're problematic. They much prefer dead ones. (laughs) You can hang that anywhere you want. (laughs) So, and 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 we never at the Bemis, we never actually put the pressure of exhibiting on an artist when they came in for a residency because that's not what they need. 
if they're by chance after the residency has you know run its course you walk into the studio and you see that there's competent complete work there that would you would love to do a show with you can then start that negotiation with the artist and say well we'll ship you your work we're going to show this work we want you to come back you know that sort of program and then the flip side of that coin is that some people want an exhibition right away and maybe we didn't want to do that so it's the curatorial concept that's another part of the bemis that you wouldn't get at mcdowell or yada or a lot of places so as one of, the, one of these, these uh these uh sites whether it's alliance of artist communities you'll have over a hundred different residency programs to review not everybody offers money in fact some of them will charge you banff is a great one i love it it's been up there but they'll charge you to be there so you know, it's, it's a pick and choose of what you want, what you need, what you can afford. So I, I recommend people to, um, you know, apply to these if they need that service. I must say that uh, it seems so odd to me now that actually universities are having courses on how to apply to artists' residencies for their students. <laughs> so I, I was really chuckling about that That's when odd. I found out that was going on. <laughs> Do any people come to the Demos more than once? Uh, we usually don't. Uh, we usually haven't done repeats. Uh, some places will. We're very transparent about our jurying process. Uh, McDowell is not. Uh, it's all secretive. Um, I. I think the one downside of this situation is what I call colony hoppers, like grasshoppers, <laughs> where yep. people never decide to have their own studio, but they go through these systems using all these other studios. So sometimes when I would get an application in and I'd look at the resume, you'd see they've been to Jirasi, they've been to Headland, they've been up, you know, uh, the call. They've been down to Atlantic Center for the Arts. They've been down to different residency programs, and you sort of realize that this person is sort of maybe using the system a little too much. So I'm kind of cautious about that a little bit. But that's me when I was the director there. I'm having you know, if somebody's done two or th two residencies, they're not going to be particularly prejudiced, prejudiced against applying for a third residency at a third location, probably. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I'm, I, we don't, uh, I don't know if they look at that anymore because okay. I haven't been involved with that process. As long as I know that we've got darn good jurors, then I know we're going to have good residencies. How much government support is there for residencies in the United States? When we started, when the Alliance formed, uh, formed itself in 1990, there was no form, no slot in the NEA for residency programs. You applied under the museum programs, which is a hell of a lot to compete against. Uh, we're not museums. We're alive. We're kicking. We're screaming. We make weird stuff. We don't make things that last sometimes at all. But we're an experience, and we're very important because if you don't start investing in the artist first, none of the rest of the cycle works. So the least amount of money goes in the beginning, which is the weirdest thing. And then, you know, 100 years later, the most amount of money comes out the other end. <laughs> so, and society's better for it. But for some reason, because artists are, I don't know, I don't find artists unpredictable. I don't find artists weird. But some people have this sort of nomenclature that artists are going to chop off their ear and attack their employees or something. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, but, but those people aren't involved in arts communities very often. Yeah, Kurt Douglas shouldn't have done Van Gogh, maybe. <laughs> but the <laughs> fact is, is that it's the best place to put your money. It's True. the best investment you can make. You know, so I don't know. Didn't seem odd to me, but it took me, 
you know, I was there 25 years as the director. I thought this was going to be simple. It was like a slam dunk to me. I mean, it's a big deal. You know, old buildings, lots of space, created people. Come on. Yeah, but I think residencies, and you guys, I want to open this up for your questions in a moment. Um, and one of the questions I want to ask you, you know, the people in the audience, is have you ever thought about participating in a residency program somewhere? Is that something that's ever occurred to you? Because, like, one of the things I like exploring in this course is, you know, somebody we spoke to, I said something about the art world, and she corrected me and said, no, there are lots of different art villages. And, you know, I think that's true. And even if you listen to Re talking about artist communities, you know, the different communities have different personalities, and they're in different locations, and the experience that you would have there is different. But the point I want to make is that you need to figure out which village you belong in and what path you want to navigate. You know, since I've sent out the link to Best of Webinars, there are some really fascinating webinars um, with Gigi Rosenberg, who talks about how to get a grant. And, you know, one of the things she talked about is applying for a grant to go to an artist residency. And, you know, or you can even apply for a grant to write an application to go to an artist residency and then get a grant for that. I mean, so that's a whole other means of funding your art career than just trying to sell your art solely. Not necessarily as everyone trying to make saleable art. You know, um, you know, we were talking with Cheryl Haynes in San Francisco recently, and she talked about, you know, how she's working with artists who have really difficult work to sell, but, you know, the belief structure and now the museum interest in that makes it feasible. Um, so, you know, one of the reasons I was really excited to talk to Ree was about exploring this other option about participating in artist communities and artists' residencies. Do you have a feeling that there's a certain there's a certain ilk of people who are specifically interested in artist residencies and a lot of others don't know about it? Um, what's your experience or how do these, you know? I think ahead. that people who have had an opportunity to um, as an outsider, visit a residency program. We do several open houses a year, open studios. Uh, sort of start to get it. And sort of start to realize that the supporting of these artists is a very good idea. Uh, but again, by our nature as program, we're rather reclusive and we are in odd spots that you don't usually come across. I do want to say one thing about when you were referencing getting grants to go to residency. The Polly Krasner Foundation, I went to see them umpteen years ago about getting money for residency programs because they give money to artists. We give money to artists. I thought, hey, hey, this works. Now well, they can't do that necessarily. But what Mr. Bergman said to me, Charlie Bergman, is he said, Ree, by the time you've juried all those artists, you have these pearls in your hand. You have these jewels in your hand. Send them to me. Let us look at their situations. And we want to help artists. To this date, over a million and a half dollars have gone to support artists who come to our program. Some people get it. Some people don't. There's no rhyme, no reason. People, I think, for sure get it, don't get it. But it has happened, and it's been many years, and it has accumulated to be a good size sum of money that's gone into supporting these residencies, then people can buy more art supplies. They can change or upgrade things they need to change. They can pay for shipping. Maybe they, they can get the photographer they want. You know, so it, it, we don't, the Bemis gets none of that. But I'll tell you something, they have a happier residency. We still give them a stipend, even if they do have the polycrasher, $25,000 or whatever they've gotten. It's usually between ten and twenty-five. That's sweet. Who's got questions? Nice. Raise your hand if you have a question. Oh, you guys, you're all, you're all melting. Trudy, go right ahead. I will that. Go ahead, Trudy. Uh, yes, um, I wonder if uh, you mentioned about the criteria um, for selection. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that. What makes a good um, application or one that rises to the top? Applications come so many ways now with the technology. You know, I, I, uh, I'm, the, I don't know, I'm a girl from the days when we had slides. <laughs> so uh, basically, I, I think it's good uh, when you're doing a residency to show a body of work that has 
um, a kind of relationship to each other. Sometimes people try to put too many things in. We always took uh, 20 slides for each artist. Uh, we're down to 10 now. So that gets it pretty tight. The NEA, when I worked with the NEA, quite often as a juror, sometimes it's five. Can you imagine? You've got your life of five slides. I mean, no wonder you want to ask that question. <laughs> it seems impossible. How do you express what you are in five slides? So um, I, I try to look for continuity. Uh, after you've been in the arts long enough and you look at enough work, you can realize when someone has mastered a skill in a, with their material. I mean, that's obvious. Then after a while, is there, you start looking, where's the talent and creativity here? What is it that you're wanting to support? These days, people are much more uh, vocal and much more good at their dissertations than they ever were before. So that's come a long way, and sometimes to their detriment. But, so it's an interesting balance. I think the work has to grab you first. Uh, sometimes we allow our judges, uh, I used to do blind jury because uh, I thought that, that sounds kind of weird, jurors are blind, but I used to do it so I'd, no one's name would come up so they didn't know if they were men or women or, you know, what's going on or if there were combos of people working together. Sometimes we get, you know, a couple of artists that are working together and ply together apply together. But uh, we, we did that for a while and then, then we switched back. You know, sometimes it gets abused. Someone is very fond of everybody from New Jersey. <laughs> I had one, one juror who wanted to have everybody from Poland in. <laughs> so I, I thought the blind jury worked pretty well because we just really looked at the work. How many times a year do you jury? We jury twice a year. And from what you just said, it sounds like you're not taking people who are right out of art school. It sounds like they have to have a track record, not necessarily a track record, but some proficiency. I don't think that's true. It seems to me there's a lot of young people over there. But I, I don't know. I, I used to look for a really good balance because I think that when you put in younger people with people who have been around the block quite often, you're going to get a whole new network for that young person to fall into. Whether they're going to be, uh, you know, they're going to learn something more from the older artist who's been been doing this for quite a while. They're going to also... I agree. How old are some of the old timers you've had? Well, I don't know. Manuel Neri was here. How old was Manuel in Italo before he passed away? I don't, I don't remember how old they were. Italo. They were 65 plus. Yeah, probably when they were here. Uh, Takako Rocky was 70 when she came from Japan. Did they have to get juried in? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I still make Okay. Mistakes. She's talking about two really significant northern Cal. Well, where, is it, where was Italo living? Southwest? Italo is down in uh, L.A. Yeah, okay. So these are really accomplished artists who um, had to be juried in. That's pretty cool. So there's, so there's definitely a range mix. Okay, Donna, let me unmute you and you can ask your question. Go ahead, Donna. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, my question, uh, Ree, is um, have you tracked at all, like, what benefits that the – the artists who have the residencies, what happens afterwards? Have any sense of like what what significance the residency had for them? Good question. You know, yeah, very good question. Um, we do try and have tried to keep track of everyone that has had a residency at Demons. Um, I would say that uh, a, a lot of people have written us back and said how meaningful that time was, how important that time was to them where they could be isolated and do their work, how uh, expanding it was for what they were trying to do or they problem solved something they've been struggling with, you know, by, by just being in a different, completely different environment, you know. Um, 
it's like seeing yourself again through a mirror in a different way maybe when you go to a residency program because you do sort of shed a skin. Um, a lot of breakthroughs that happened for people, you know, they were able to excel. A few people uh, had two or three that over the years, you know, didn't continue in the arts at all, for sure. Um, but it's uh, it's it's rather amazing that uh, we found that we get catalogs all the time from shows and show flyers and so forth that we kind of keep up with the artists. And I haven't really checked out the Bemis website. I think they were definitely, I'm on the board now because I don't run it. Uh, they were definitely trying to track uh, former artists and actually keep everyone connected. So a lot of that's going on because they also call on former artists who succeeded more in life now to also donate to um, the auction they have every year, which raises, I think they raise, Oh, about three or four hundred thousand dollars a year at that auction here in Omaha. That's pretty cool. There's also, I mean, I, I would suspect there's some synergy between the people who participate, and there's some relationships formed, and perhaps marriages, um, but that you know that continue. I think that's very true. I know that people have. I know a, a German artists who are actually showing in Texas as friends they had doing a residency. The Texas artist is showing in Germany and Berlin. I mean, it, it, that kind of exchange happens spontaneously. Unwritten rule uh, over there at the Bemis is uh, if the door's closed, you don't want to see anybody. If you got a brick in the door or something in the door that's propped open, you want to talk. And of course, there are those potlucks and all those other things where people get together. Yes, we've had some, uh, obviously, uh, marriages and people have uh, gone off in the sunset together and some people who've separated, too. Yeah, I'm sure all that happens. Um, you know, one of the things we talk about a lot in this course is growing relationships and how, you know, it's, it's not sufficient to just make good art and that relationships are important. I, th I feel like an artist residency is a lot like a working vacation with your spouse except instead of your spouse it's your artwork and you have the opportunity to focus on your art as many hours a day as you want with the, leaving behind the vast majority of distractions you have at home. I'm going to use that. That's pretty good. <laughs> I'll send you the recording. You can just take it, babe. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. Perry, it's your turn. Go ahead, Perry. Yeah, I was in uh, artist residency twice in Minnesota, not too far, but uh, it was very productive. Um, I later gave uh, artwork for them to use for six years for covers for their poultry journal. I'm wondering, uh, my goal is to either get a gallery or two, well, one in New York City, and I'm thinking I have to move there to do so. Are there any residencies in New York City? Uh, I would go or, through that. Yes, PS1 is one of the best, which is an old school in Brooklyn which um, has been taken over by Mona a bit now. I'm not too sure. They're still doing residencies. There's several of them in that area and outstate New York also. Uh, I would go refer to the Alliance immediately, Alliance Virus Communities, and just start going through there and finding the ones you want. Specify a state. I think they can, you can uh, find it that way. I don't know about that idea of having to be in New York to get a gallery. Uh, I, I live with an artist who uh, doesn't want to deal with New York. He doesn't like the fact that people are under pressure there a lot, and they're they're just uh, he just he just doesn't like the politics in New York. So we've never had a gallery on the East Coast, uh, or I should say, in New York. Um, but it, Who's talking about her husband, Jun Kaneko? How many, you know, let's talk about studio space. How many square feet of studio space does he have in Omaha? 255,000. Which would be a little bit compromising in New York. It'd be like the, half, the whole southern tip of the island. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the problem. He needs space. And that's, you know, we could talk about why you live in certain places. But I don't know if you really need to, I mean, I meet a lot of artists that come in from New York and they're, first of all, they, they the, the women after a, a, few, a few weeks say, I've stopped watching behind my back. I can't believe how liberated I feel. 
um, it, it, the intensity of a city like that takes a lot of energy to live in. That's great. Some people thrive off of that energy. Some people are blown away by it. Some people are overwhelmed by it. I mean, I used to have a friend who worked two jobs, and by the time he got to his studio in Hoboken, where he had to step over people with heroin needles, to get to his studio, he was so traumatized he couldn't work and he had to get out of there before it got dark. <laughs> so what do you do? You know? But it's it's great. I love the energy in New York and I can take about two weeks of it and I've had enough. Hey Perry, in the spring of 2012, we did a webinar with Mark Kostabi, the K K O S T A B I, who spoke a lot about what you have to do in New York to have a gallery, et cetera. And you can, you know, you can listen to that and get some insight. Thank you. I want to go back to Trudy for a second because her hand's still up and I feel like maybe I cut her off. Trudy, did no, you have more to ask? No, you didn't. I forgot to turn it off. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> no worries. Speaking. I can't find the screen where I would raise my hand, so consider my hand raised. Okay. All right, the, all right, because Trudy had the same problem when she discovered how to do that. Oh At the bottom of the list of names where it says um, audio. Well, I don't, there see that, I don't see the screen with the list of names anymore, and I wonder if it's because you're sharing your desktop. It is. At any rate, please go ahead. And I'm going to stop sharing my desktop, and I'll do it again if need be, but that way maybe more people can raise their hands if they want. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Dana. Um, hi, Ree. Thanks for doing the webinar. Um, my question is, how can I participate some with CMIS and get to know the organization? I'm not in a life position right now where I can do a residency without kids. I, I took my kids when they were two and four for the summer residency at the Archie Bray, and uh, you know I probably won't do that again. Uh, how can I how can I get involved with CMIS if I'm if I'm not doing a residency? How could you get involved if you're not doing a residency? Are you near us at all? I'm in Chicago. I'm not terribly far. Yeah, yeah. I know. I I know Archie Bray, and your kids had a good place to run around. That's they for sure. Loved it. And I loved it too. It was wonderful. But you know, yeah, of course it was, yeah. It's, it's hard for you to work because it's, you're in a new environment. And you want to share it with your kids, and they want to explore everything. Mm -hmm. So that's hard. It's hard, and you don't want to prevent them from being that way. So the, the ways to interact with the Bemis. I would imagine um, that we would have to uh, find someone over there and ask them ways that you could interact with them and what might be happening that uh, that you could interact with. Because we're really ha a hands-on kind of place, you know. I mean, we really... Like, could I propose, for example, a, a workshop or something that's, that's more... Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, if you need to come in for a weekend or a week or something, you could propose something like that. That's not a problem at all. I would I would write Mark Masuoka as a director. You can see that online if you look at the Bemis. Okay. You can see the Bemis online. It's got it's Mark's been in like a decade at least now, hasn't it? Yeah. Right now we're making rainbows. We've got an artist who's doing rainbows over the Bemis. It's been quite a project. The but myth, uh, right? I've seen images. Yeah. So there that's true. Uh, we we used to do things more like that in the past. Uh, I would say in the last 10 years, we've gotten pretty much oriented to using the residents that are in residency, you know, using the artists in residency who are in residency for doing things. We don't ask them to teach. Mm -hmm. I used to have an extensive uh, separate program for education. It was kind of a, again, because we're urban. Uh, you know, there's a lot of kids that need it, art education that's been cut out of the schools. So one of our goals was to try to supplement that and actually uh, go around the community doing things. But I actually took, a, if an artist res, was a resident artist, they could say to us, I mean, we'd give them an option, would you like to, you know, go paint a mural with some local artists with a bunch of kids, you know, or do you want to do something like that? Of course, we also have artists that want to get involved. I had a we had a woman artist here who wanted to work with battered women. So again, we're placing that artist in that community, working with those women. We've had uh, artists who were only interested in looking at scars. They wanted to get it. It was the English artist. They only wanted to uh, deal with uh, photographing people's scars. I thought she was going to traumatize people, so but we did find her a plastic surgeon who was able to help her. 
So, you know, we've had artists uh, doing uh, civic projects out in the community a lot, but I would think if, if uh, you, would, you should probably talk to Mark Masuoka and ask them how you can interact with this. We're only like an hour away from you on the airplane. Right. Very close. Um, our given residency, they all have their own personalities and affinities, but some seem to be, I mean, do you have a different media than affinity than other in, um, residencies, or is it all pretty Something general? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, basically, uh, we're mostly visual arts. Uh, we do have a wood shop. We do, we will have a ceramic facility again, a large sculptural ceramic facility again. They just renovated that other building. Uh, we do have welding. Uh, we do have woodworking. We do have a relationship with the university in printmaking. I didn't want to get into printmaking. They have a fine department here and they're very, they like Bemis a lot so you can go in there and, and, and use that. I mean that's a whole, you almost need a whole tech person to take care of. Is there a good art store in, in, in Omaha? Uh, I wouldn't say they're excellent. I would say they have good departments that are usable, and it would be helpful if someone would go in there and use them more than the students. <laughs> do you have a store? Do you have an art supply facility at the Venus, or people have to? How do they find what they need? Uh, there are art supply stores in the city, but a lot of people, you know, want to order it from someplace else. I get the feeling that Ragdale, I'm thinking about Dana's question, I get the feeling that Ragdale does shorter residencies and is pretty close to Chicago. Is that true? Do you know me? Yes, and they're mostly writers, and there is one, two, two good sized painting studios there, though. And they just finished renovating the old house. And they sit on that big piece of land there, too. And they're what? They're in Lake Forest, right? Yeah, they're up to, what is it, about an hour and 15 minutes or something up there? Depends. Could be an hour. Uh, okay, cool. Andrea, you have a comment. You have like a question. This is going to be fun. Go ahead, Andrea. I wanted to say hello, Ree. And I hi, just Annie. Hi. It's it's great to uh, see you here. Thank you. Former resident. Yeah, I always want to say the most wonderful things. The Venus has been uh, just a huge, very important part of my artistic career. I was a resident at the Venus very shortly after graduate school. It was quite supportive. And and then and then I was uh, a resident twice years after that with an exhibition. And I just want to say that it was extremely important in a network of artists too. Both times I was there in an international network of artists. For when I was a, a younger artist recently out of graduate school, it played a very important part in the networking and giving me the time and space to produce two very important bodies of work at that that point in time. So uh, it was the Venus has been a gigantic player, I think, in the success and so very supportive of my career. And I can't recommend it highly enough. And thank you and thank you for everybody at the Venus, 1999, 2001, <laughs> and back in time. Uh, but I can't recommend it highly enough for everybody else in in the webinar here. Uh, there's it's an amazing space that is conducive to, I, I think you can expand, you can be very private, but for me it was a very uh, balanced place of inter interactivity with artists. And also you can go back into your studio and be very private and get the work done that you need to do. And uh, it's, it's, I think it's the best residency in the world, actually. I've been to a number of international residencies too, and uh, the Venus is my favorite, so I continue to support it. So wow. Very really, it really very is. Very yeah. Where are you at now, Andrea? I'm, I'm currently in Brooklyn. So. In Brooklyn. <laughs> in Minneapolis <laughs> and Brooklyn. <laughs> so. Yes. Yeah. But it's great. But um, yeah, thank you so much. So. Well, it's a. Uh, I think we established some basic rules that really haven't been changed. Some things have been changed, but the basic rules are the same. You know, striving for a certain kind of quality. The funny thing about residency programs is artists don't necessarily, they're not too sure who they want to be with sometimes, you know? And so you really got to keep the quality high so that everybody's pretty comfortable, you know, and at that level. Because sometimes it can, 
differ, I think, in some residency programs. But again, the Alliance and Res Artis do a great job of letting you know what's around. And you can read and you can communicate with people now. It's, it's so much easier than it was in the past. I mean, I had somebody from New York come, uh, Annabeth Rosen, came with six months of shoe, shampoo and toothpaste thinking she was really going to the boonies, you know. So <laughs> you never know what people think. And these days with the uh, Internet, you can actually even probably look into a studio. So uh, it's changed a lot. <laughs> It but it's doing, great. it's doing great. I, I'm really pleased with what Mark has done with the uh, with Bemis. He anchored it a little more in town, but, and I, I wasn't so concerned about you know anchoring it so much in the community. I was just in, concerned of getting people to come to Omaha. Got it. Thank you both, Andrea Ree. Thank you. Hey, Mark, you had a question, and then you took your hand down or something. But I'm calling on you anyway. Did you want to ask something? Well, most of my question was already answered, but one part that I did want to touch on again, if I could get back to the uh, application process and the review of applications. Is it, would you say that the body of work is more important than the resume, or is the resume more important than the body of work? Um, I think those are equal. I think I was trying to discuss something about a dissertation that sometimes people do, or trying to explain their work. and. And I, I find, even sometimes with the NEA, and until you get down to the nitty gritty, people don't start looking into that stuff. They really go, number one, they go by what they visually see, okay. at least for visual artists, of course. It's probably very different in other kinds of programming that you're in. But the fact is, is that after you've sorted through that many applications, you kind of, uh, kind of then narrow it down a bit and you kind of start picking up and saying, okay, where is this person from? Where have they been? Where are they educated at? And then you can sometimes, you know, if it gets even further down, you can start to look at what they might think they're going to do in a residency program or, you know, what they want to say about their work. So I would say, in my, in my mind, at least the way I like the jury, is to be impacted by the visual first be caught by what a person's doing and then I want some information about it but that's Thank me you. so okay. that's helpful thank you well yeah. I mean, there's a bunch of artists who are married whose spouse is, in, is immersed in the art world or is only tangentially in the art world are there a number of artists who come without their partner spouse uh, we usually now I think they don't really do spouses they don't really take a partner. We used to do that, but we don't. They don't do that now so much. So that there's a number of artists who come solo, who are you know in a significant relationship, who come without their spouse. I'm trying to encourage people who might be in that relation, that situation, to consider this regardless. Well, you know, and I, I I do think that you can also decide whether or not you want to you know support another kind of situation if your studio is covered and if you have a stipend maybe. Renting a small apartment for a little while or something would be fine. Um, I think you can also talk to the residency program. The reason I, I did it at first is because I didn't really think you had to burden an artist or their family by taking the artist out of their situation without their support system. You know, we all need each other in some ways, you know, in your relationship. So why remove that if you're going to go for a residency? I mean, it is in a nunnery. <laughs> so why not uh why not just uh bring everybody with you and make it work? We did put a rule on cats and dogs, finally. That's <laughs> another problem. Snakes are okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it 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 is a I think it, it depends on the residency and I think again you can talk to people about it. Some rules are bendable and some aren't. Cool. Hey, Perry, did you have a follow-up question? Well, I'm wondering if uh, is I'm I'm uh, 65. Is ageism a part of residency choices? I plan on going another 30 years, but uh, should I be concerned about ageism? And then the other part of the question, or a different part, is is there a advantage? 
for an artist's career to go to certain residencies over other ones? The first question was in regard to your age. You felt that, I missed a little bit of that. You felt that maybe your age was too high up for a residency program? I mean, is there ageism in residencies decisions? Oh, wait, do we make a decision about age? No, no. I'm I'm older than you. Come on, <laughs> we can still kick the ball. Uh, sure, I wouldn't I wouldn't hesitate at all. In fact, a lot of residency programs even have studios that are for uh, people that are disabled or people that are have AIDS. The uh, watershed did a whole program with around people with AIDS. You know, so they're they're fine. Okay, if you want to talk about which residency programs are more prestigious than others, yeah, that's true. There there is that in the field. Uh, some of them are harder to get into. PS one's a hard one. Uh, I would say that Haystack is kind of tough. Bemis isn't easy. Uh, Montalvo. Bemis is or is not easy? Would you say? Bemis is hard to get into. I I. You know, I tell people if you don't get it the first time, try again. One blessing about changing the judges, which I am adamant about, is that you don't get any kind of flavor to your residency program. You really are throwing yourself out there and saying, okay, five more judges for the next season, you know, or the next half a year. So that's, that really puts the residency program, too, on a, a kind of a, well, here come the artists, you know, and these are what people chose, and then the next time you're going to have something completely different. Sometimes you have jurors who really like installation. Sometimes they love painters. Sometimes you can find a good painter. I don't know. It's difficult, but it's up to the judges. And once we decide that we've selected, that we've asked good qualified judges, then we have to trust that system. But there are different residency programs, and uh, some of them are, are uh, uh, more prestigious than others. Yaddo and, and McDowell have been around the longest. They sort of fight with each other who's been 102 or 103 years old. Wow. So, but, uh, you know, and there's great young upstarts. One of the interesting things about the Alliance of Artists Community is you can also look on their website and they'll, they'll uh, sell you a kit on how to start a residency program. And you'd be surprised how many people would like to do something with their old building or that giant ranch or that farm. Or, you know, their, their, their son was going to be an artist and they want to do that, you know. So it's, it's interesting. It's very interesting to see all these, when you go to those websites and see all these different places, you know, that are involved with uh, supporting artists in some way or another or providing an opportunity. Thank you both. I think we are about out of time. Sarah Jo, I want to let you talk, but we have to wrap this up promptly soon. Go ahead, Sarah Jo. Hi, Ree. Thank you. This has been really interesting. Um, well, the quick question would be, where do the judges come from? Are they local, or are you doing this, um, you know, through, how does that work? We actually bring our judges in from all over the United States. Um, sometimes they're closer by, like Kansas City, uh, Chicago. Those are, Chicago's an hour away by plane. You know, those, but lots of times they come in from different parts of the United States. They are usually uh, from different disciplines, which I appreciate because you don't want all of them to be painters. Um, and they also sometimes are curatorial people, museum people. Shy away a little bit from that sometimes, but... Do the judges than, physically come to Omaha to do the jurying? They physically come to Omaha and do the jurying for three days. Wow, okay. They right. recently, I must say they recently started a program where they uh, gave, like the NEA, where they give you, you know, 50 people to go through, and then you come back, you know, with your reports on those people. But uh, I haven't checked to see exactly how they're handling it now, because we used to like to get everybody together all the time, and they still bring everybody in, the judge, just so anyway. And that way they understand what they're jurying about, too by actually being in the facility. So wait, did the jurors have a conversation about whether they should let an individual participate? Uh, the jurors can squabble over who they want to get in and okay. not get in, just like you do at the NEA. Got it. 
All right. I think this has been fabulously informative. We've run out of time, but I, you know, this was really great and I've learned a lot because, you know, though I was on the board a million years ago, there's a whole lot more that's developed and changed and grown and stuff that I didn't even know then. So this has been wonderful and I think the people had really good questions. Let me unmute everybody so we can all together say thank you very much. Me, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very thank much. You. All right. I'm going to stop this recording.